welcome at Bad Industry Seminar. I have a pleasure to introduce uh, Kuba Melczek from uh, IQM. Uh, so Kuba uh, did his master uh, thesis in UCL, working in experimental uh, condensed matter physics. Then uh, he moved to Oxford, working with uh, uh, approach to experimental with the approach to quantum computing based on uh, uh, molecular spins. And after his uh, PhD thesis, he was hired by uh, quantum startup IQM, when he's now a senior quantum engineer, uh, working on calibration, verification, and benchmarking of quantum devices. So it's a great pleasure to have you, Kuba. Uh, and uh, yeah, he'll be telling us about, uh, uh, yeah, like what he was he has been up to and company in the last uh, couple of years, I guess. So, uh, yeah, so, uh, thank you for the introduction. Welcome everybody to my talk. Thanks for this opportunity. And uh, today I'd like to talk to you a little bit about, uh, I was asked to talk about calibration of our, our devices. So I have some, some detailed topics and some topics I will, I was not allowed to talk about. So some things with more detail, some things with less detail, but the overall structure that I'd like to offer you Today is first, I will talk about our devices, what they are, what are our qubits, what is our software, very briefly. And then we will talk about our single qubit gates, our readout, our two qubit gates. And uh, afterwards, uh, I will also talk about how I, how we benchmark our uh, our devices. And if you have time, I will also briefly mention uh, how we benchmark entire chips uh, rather than uh, single gates. Uh, I will not talk about that much about readouts and about the ordering of, of the experiments, as well as the characterization of the Hamiltonians, uh, because those topics, there will be way too much to talk about. But we do have an automated solution that orders the experiments that we do um, uh, dynamically. Uh, uh, so those things I'm going to talk about are just building blocks that we sort of put together in a bigger hole later on. Uh, so let's begin. So currently we have uh, four different chips in the main uh, category. So the first two, the five qubit and the 20 qubit are the mature devices that we sort of offer and sell and you can get access to. And then uh, the 54 and 150 are in various states, state the stages of development. Can I have a question? Sure. So do you, do you also sell chips for society without the device? There were instances of that, but it didn't really and very well, because the people who we sell them to, sold them to didn't really, like they had trouble integrating that. And then we had to support and then it didn't work. So we prefer not to do that. Uh, yes. Um, okay. So let's a little bit talk about what they are. So the five qubit chip, I put the full chip layout and how it looks. Uh, and on the 20 qubit, we were way too complicated to do that. So this is just an overview of what is what. Um, we have qubits and couplers on the chip, but both of those elements are actually transmons. So mathematically, they are the same thing. They are just optimized to serve different purposes. So they have different parameters. Um, the spiral things that you see are the readout resonators that are used to measure individual qubits. And we only measure the five qubits that are called qubits that are the ones that you uh, compile your algorithm to that you actually perform quantum computation on. I'm sorry, you have uh, separate uh... Resonators per every qubit. Yes. Or... Yes, but there's only one line that that connects to all of them. For the five qubit and for the twenty, there's three lines. Mm -hmm. Um. So this is what we sell at IQM Spark, and this is what is available on cloud to use. Okay. So I said that our devices employ transform qubits. So um, I will talk a little bit briefly about what transform qubits are. We won't go into details. Um. Essentially, they are not really qubits because they're based on uh, harmonic, uh, quantum harmonic oscillators, which you just replace the the inductance in the in the in the circuit by a nonlinear element, which is called Josephson junction. And Josephson junction is really the the source of 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 how why you can even do quantum computation on this because you can define the computational subspace to just be zero and one because the transition between zero and one is different than transition one and two. And specifically for transforms, because there are different kinds of superconducting qubits, those transitions are really close. So we define something called alpha unharmonicity, which is the difference between the transitions from zero, one and one, two. 
and this alpha is typically quite small compared to the actual transition frequency. So we have, for example, 4.2 gigahertz transition between uh, 0 and 1, and the alpha would be minus, two, minus, minus 200 megahertz. Uh, so here on the right, oh, you can see uh, how the qubit actually looks on the chip. So uh, this, this diagram here corresponds to what you see here. Uh, and the purple is the drive antenna. This is where the microwaves and microwave uh, enter. Uh, this is capacitively coupled to the actual qubit. And then you have the inductively coupled, uh, something we call a flux line, which is another antenna, which delivers the DC voltage, voltage pulses uh, to tune the frequency of the qubit. And then the yellow line is the connection to the resonator. Okay. Um, so I mentioned that the uh, we can tune qubit frequency dynamically. So this is all based on the Josephson effect. I'm not talking. I'm not be showing you any Hamiltonians because this is not a lecture about transforms. But essentially, you can see that there are two axes here, and uh, each of the these is a Josephson junction. And um, the way it works is that if you apply external magnetic flux to such loop of two Josephson junctions, then the superconducting phase here. Uh, changes by the amount of flux that's going through the loop. And uh, by itself, this device is known as squid and is used to measure very, very small magnetic fields as well. Uh, so, but we use it uh, in such a way that when you apply voltage to this, to this antenna, it produces a current which produces some magnetic field, which then changes the transition energy and lets us change the qubit frequency. Uh, dynamically and statically. So we can set some value or we can pulse it. So we move it up and down to change the frequency for a little bit. Um, yes, so our uh, our two cubic gates employ um, the ZZ coupling. So what it is, and a, I mean, you for sure you actually know what it is, but we like just like to experiment to think about this as when one cube is excited, the frequency of the other changes. So we don't want this to be on all the time. So the solution that we use is the coupler. The coupler is this uh, brown thing in the middle. I said both of those things are transforms, but you can see that the shapes are completely different. And that's why, that's because they are op optimized to serve a different purpose. The purpose of a transform is that um, when you change its frequency to a particular value, the free interactions between the qubit and the transform, uh, the, the qubit and the coupler and the, and the other qubit and the coupler and the direct interaction between the two qubits uh, cancels as uh, as far as we only consider the uh, two level systems of both qubits. Uh, so then we can uh, make this interaction go to zero, and then we can treat the qubits as uh, separate separate systems as as long as we don't go into higher excited states. So as long as you just keep in the first first two states of, of both qubits, and we keep the coupler in a certain place, then they are isolated system. There's no coupling between them which makes it usable uh, as a quantum computer because you, you can do a thing with big gates. Um, so that's what's on the chip. And uh, here is sort of the, the level diagram of, of different levels that are involved in the typical calibration. Uh, so you would, we would put the two zero, the couplers in the middle, uh, so two zero uh, level on resonance with one one. Uh, but I will talk about this later while we do that. Sorry, can I have a question? Sure. Uh, the problem that you have with, like, uh, if you have, I don't know, the higher order excitation, uh, is it due to some, like, physical phenomena or, like, physical law, or is it just the quirk of how you optimize your software, basically, because it's sort of hardware? So, so that you want to actually only work on qubits? So, okay, if you have higher excitation, then maybe some will be coupling. But uh, what I'm asking is that, is it something which is, like, put be problematic to construct a quantum computer on, or like, I don't know, grids or whatever. Uh, so we just optimize it this way. Uh, okay. It is so, possible there are like proposals to make a coupler that completely turns off all the interaction. Hmm. Uh, but okay. those things are experimentally much more difficult to realize. Yeah. Well, and so we are just stopping here. Okay. And I will actually come back to this if I if I have time, because I have to be worried time. It's a lot of stuff when you ask um, a question. So I'd rather I answer your question. No, no. We can be relaxed, you know. No, no. I, I'd rather ask your questions than talk about some stuff that I have prepared. So it's, it's okay. Um, okay. Uh, the other, the last thing on the chip are the reader resonators that I mentioned before. 
So we see that there are two spirals. So the, the spiral that's closer to the readout line is called the personal filter. And that is responsible for not letting the qubit decay through the resonator. So because of this, uh, these two spirals, the readout structure looks like this. So it's not like a single dip that you would expect, but there's actually two dips. Um, but either way, the resonator frequency is dependent on the qubit state. So this is called the dispersive, uh, uh, dispersive readout because you're, you're able to measure the resonator frequency or the response from the resonator without uh, changing the uh, the qubit state. I mean, you measure it, but you don't like affect it too much, right? So this is called the quantum non-destructive measurement. So uh, then if you pick a point, pick a readout frequency that you like, and you send some pulse, then you can recover a response that very nicely splits between the ground and excited state. Again, I will talk about it later as well. Okay, and the software that we use, um, we have a bunch of different abstraction levers that you can use. So first of all, you can just program quantum circuits with your favorite quantum programming language. Um, and that is translated into the instrument firmware of our, our, our software. And then we also have pulse level access that we use to also do calibration and to have full access to instrument settings. And because people ask me this question all the time when they present, I will tell you that if anyone buys the system and the system is physically somewhere, then this person or the group of people gets access to all the software. But they might decide to put the uh, put the quantum computer on some kind of cloud access, which they don't give you the access to the instrument settings. For example, in Finland, the uh, Lumi uh, five qubit quantum computer, they can change all the settings and they have the software, but they offer it on cloud to people without that access, right? So that's the that's the difference. Okay. You probably know what the gates are. Uh, in classical computers, we have a uh, universal two, uni two gates that form a universal set uh, and lets us compile any algorithm. So for quantum computers, we also need a set of universal quantum gates. And what we use is we have all the single qubit gates. So you can do any arbitrary single qubit gate. And then for our two qubit gates, we choose the conditional conditional Z, which is together enough to compile any circuit. And then we have readouts to measure the qubit in Z basis. So it's always in Z basis. In order to do something else, you need to uh, do gates. So let's start from the single qubit gates. This is the standard way of doing things with microwaves. Um, the transition is on the microwave, uh, has a microwave frequency. So we just drive it with the correct frequency, and the qubit state will change to oscillate between 0 and 1. Um, uh, typically, we calibrate the X gate for five poles uh, by shaping the post, for example, as a Gaussian or as a cosine. So it starts at zero and then ends at zero because uh, we want the post to be quite short so that it's not affected by decoherence. But the longer the post is, the easier it is to actually hit only the correct frequency because the shorter the post, the longer the Spectral. Um, I think so. Typically, we calibrate uh, in order to get other single qubit gates. We can, for example, vary uh, amplitude and phase, uh, which is the uh, simplest way by varying amplitude to vary the angle of rotation. And we're varying the phase, which is understood as a microwave phase, has a direct, um, uh, it's directly the same thing as just changing the axis and the rotation in the XY plane. Um, Alternatively, we can calibrate specifically uh, the square root of x or if I have two poles, and then uh, sandwich arbitrary z rotations between them, which is a more advanced solution if this varying is not uh, enough, it's not good enough. Um, I mentioned the z gates. Uh, the, the, the way that we do them is uh, using the virtual z rotation, which is uh, just changing the phase of all the pulses that happen later. and uh, on a circuit level, that is equivalent to just taking all the Z rotations and moving them all the way to the end of the circuit through all the gates and not adjusting what the gates are doing. And then because we measure in Z basis, we just don't do those gates ever. Because if they are just next to the readout, we just delete them. And that doesn't change the measurement outputs. So that is a standard practice by basically everybody who's doing uh, superconducting quantum circuits. Uh, yeah, so that is enough to do anything. Um, Okay, I don't actually need the slides, but I will just, if someone is not um, 
familiar with the with the with this, this um, terminology. Uh, we're using this I and Q terminology from the mixers. So I uh, part of the single cubic gate, the envelope is the can be understood as a real part or the part that is an envelope with a cosine signal, and then the Q can be understood as an imaginary part, which is something that on, that multiplies the sine signal. Uh, okay, we'll not be confusing you too much with this. Okay, so the actual calibration of single cubic gate, the basic calibration is the Rabi experiment. So what we typically do is we select some width of the pools and some shape, and then we just change the amplitude uh, observing Rabi oscillations. And uh, this experiment lets us both find out what is the correct amplitude to drive the qubit to the uh, first excited state, and also what is the readout parameters that give you that. Because you just measure some oscillation in a complex plane and just pick, okay, this value is zero, this value is one. So we can then do other experiments. Um, yes, uh, so this is pretty standard. Um, sorry, uh, how, how do you deal uh, uh, with spam errors? Like, because uh, you somehow can, mm -hmm. it's hard to like sort of distinguish between, you know, whether you hit well, the, you know, like say zero state or mm -hmm. one state or uh, like maybe there is like mismatch in like how we prepare states or how we read out the states mm -hmm. already on the stage. Yeah, so this on the stage, it's actually not that big of a problem because I, I'm not saying that the gate is going to be amazing. Uh, it is, typically has quite large errors that come from what you just said, but it is enough to sort of do other things at this point, right? And then we have a, a more advanced techniques to actually get the single cubic gate to be good. We we also calibrate the readout, um, and here actually uh, we just do a lot of repetitions. And the average signal from the zero state will be quite well defined as well as the average signal from the one state will be also quite well defined. Obviously, if the, there's like a huge rabbit hole that I can go into, like is this qubit is happens to be coupled to some other things quite strongly, then all of this changes. And you, for example, can have an oscillation that like goes up or or like goes like becomes smaller and smaller or things like this. But typically, as as soon as we get this sort of nice picture that we trust it for a time being. Uh, okay, so quite standard method, basically the same experiment to find the qubit frequency, uh, just normal spectroscopy as you do NMR or ESR. Uh, this peak here is the 2, 0,2 photon transition, so it's important to uh, pick the correct peak. And also this shows us like how close are the transitions in the transform. And uh, this is only barely uh, possible to do quantum computation with this system. Because if those two things are on overlapping, then you cannot do anything. Uh, yes, to find the uh, frequency, we do the Ramsey experiment, which is just two pi over two pulses, which at this point are just scaled down pi pulses, and we sweep the delay. Uh, both of those pulses are detuned, so they we have some guess for frequency, and we take the pulse on the lower frequency and the higher frequency, and based on the oscillation produced by both. Um, we can figure out what the qubit frequency is. Uh, we expect the, the oscillation, the frequency of the oscillation is proportional to the difference from the frequency used to measure it and the actual qubit frequency. So by now, it's in the middle. Uh, yeah, so we automatically analyze this. And let's move on to more advanced topics, uh, so that's sort of the second level of single cubic gates. Uh, so as I, as I described before, the, this is like a simple Hamiltonian that we use to uh, to uh, investigate those things. Um, and uh, this is the drive part, and you have the Q envelope, which multiplying the cosine and the sine, we can treat them as in the single cubic gates. First of all, we have the coherence, the longer the gate, the more likely these will appear. And then you have the coherent errors, uh, your angle might not be correct. You might have a phase errors, which come from interaction with the higher state. So you can sort of think about this as qubit frequency changing when there is microwave field, like bosonic microwave field. Or you can think about it as qubit getting to the second excited state during the gate and then going out of it at the end of the gate. So that generates a phase shift. You have the distortion of the phase of the pulse to change the shape from what you want it to be. And then you have leakage 
which uh, puts the puts the qubit into second excited state, and that is all only important when the gate is very short, because then you cannot contain the spectrum, um, uh, and it hits this other transition, which is really close. So how do we deal with those things? Uh, first, we have this error amplification experiment, which we just uh, uh, apply in many many gates. So two exits are supposed to be identity. So we are supposed to, we're supposed to get the same exact signal from all of those experiments. But if there's an error in the angle, that it typically gets something that either increases or decreases. So we just use a lot of different amplitudes and just select the one that is the best um, by uh, standard methods, uh, fitting a line to the slope of this. And that's how we can get the better angle. Uh, and then for to reduce this, this means like that the growth is smaller, the smallest or uh, yes, yeah, yeah. So typically it will go uh, like the error will happen with so we have under rotation on this side and over rotation on this side. So we just get to where it is exact, right? So here, like without any spam errors, you would have exactly zero point five because you're preparing an equal square position. So you see from this data set that it's not exactly zero point five. So you are affected by it, but it doesn't matter because you're just looking at the slope of this being being flat, right? Instead of like, like a specific point. So this is how we deal with that. Just like try to decouple different errors as much as possible. So so far I was only talking about the amplitude in the, the envelope in the real part of the cube. Uh, we also uh, so so the i. And the, the queue, we use something called derivative removal, uh, adiabatic gate or drag. And so what drag does is you can add the derivative, like something proportional to the derivative of your envelope to the imaginary channel. And that way you minimize the space errors or, or the leakage errors, depending on what sort of value you pick. You cannot do both at the same time because they actually look at different parts of the spectrum. Um, and typically what we do, we just minimize the phase error because leakage does not affect us if the gate is long enough. And so we would don't have don't have to push it that uh, that low. And so that would be a typical, it's not that short, but typically, but this is, would be the shape that we use uh, for our gates. So we have a cosine, raised cosine uh, in the real channel, in the imagine that channel is the side. Um, and that lets us suppress the transition that corresponds to so the part of the spectrum. This is the uh, the spectrum, right? Uh, corresponds to the phase error uh, appearing um, because of the if you minimize the leakage, we cannot minimize the phase. Then we have to fix the phase with the virtual z rotation, uh, and uh, that is sort of so. If we go with this solution, then we typically just uh, calibrate the pi over two, and then we sort of on a circuit level, create all the single cubic gates, because then it's too many things to keep track of. And the typical way to fix this uh, Q component is we start from just a shape that looks like a derivative of whatever we have the real part, and we apply Y squared of X, and then X squared of Y, and we, again, change the amplitude of this thing, and they happen to cross at the point where the amplitude is correct. So you will have this point here. Uh, right, how much time do I have? Uh, not much, but uh, okay, so this is the advanced the one over, yeah, half an hour, there, right? Excuse me, over half an hour, yeah, okay, yeah. Let's, let's go. So, I will try to introduce <laughs> this as well. So, this is the actual research topic from, from our team that is uh, published, I mean, not published yet, but it's being published, it's on archive, uh, which is uh, the um. Which has to do with optimization of the shape. So Eric wanted to have the pools that's very, very short to minimize the incoherent errors. And that means we have to deal with those other things like leakage and all of those things. So for the I component, we start with like a series of cosine. So a, a, a cosine Fourier series. Uh, yes, yeah, so I said that same thing twice. And then you um in simulate so maybe sorry, because mm -hmm. I, I... <laughs> Maybe can you go back because this is like follow up to what you showed previously. Yes. Uh, right. Can you just go back and sort of, uh, um, yeah, sort of, 
Right. So you have this like just mm -hmm. can you just move back? I'm just sorry through this uh, this part. Like so you 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 have single cube gates. You yeah. have some various mm -hmm. classes of errors, coherent yes, uh, leakage, yeah. and, and so on. Yeah. And then uh, right, and then you you take different pulse strategies mm -hmm. of generating pulses yeah. to minimize various. So okay, yeah, can we just reset here? Because at least I yeah. Uh, maybe uh, just like maybe lost the big picture a bit. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. I mean, this is I, I kind of might have been a bit too ambitious to include all of this uh, very. No, no, it's, it's great. Great. Just yeah. uh, you know, because uh, there, yeah, just maybe a bit, you, you know, uh, uh, how to phrase it. Like, uh, uh, yeah. So, so the, the subsequent sites you had different. Also, styles mm -hmm. aiming for like yeah yeah. Can we just uh, rehash it again? Okay, so I will probably just skip the uh, most advanced part in that case, uh, but just to talk about this. Um, for for all of this, we just pick some shape that we like, mm -hmm. which typically is a cosine, and then we just work with that. Um, and the only thing that we calibrate is the relative uh, amplitude between the real part and the imaginary part to suppress this phase error. And uh, to measure it, we just try to generate the phase error in different ways. And then we uh, find the point. I have a question. So, mm -hmm. so you use cosine, no? Because IBM quantum uses uh, the cutoff, uh, Gaussian root cutoff. You yes. Okay. We did use that before, but then cosine is better. Cosine is better. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Yes, yes, yes. Because the Gaussian is only better if your pulse actually doesn't have a cutoff. So if you compare cutoff Gaussian to the non cutoff, uh, non cut cosine, then the non cut cosine wins because it naturally goes to zero and it has a derivative zero, zero. Um, and Gaussian doesn't have that, so we have to cut it off, and that means that it becomes worse. Uh, so yes, so we do use cosine in most of the applications. There is this, uh, there, like in, 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 in this advanced topic, we actually use a pulse that looks like this, uh, which is a, a result of the optimization for leakage specifically. So let's just skip through that quickly. And I will just tell you what is the most important result. The most important result of this thing is that you can measure the leakage on this pulse shape, and it is very low. It is an order of uh, almost 10 to minus 5 uh, with 6 nanosecond gain. So it's, it's, uh, it's very, very low leakage if you apply the strategy, and uh, you really target the transition that leads to the leakage, as you want the spectral density there to be zero. Uh, okay. Let's uh, move. Uh, so can I ask yeah. for, for what type of gates is it? Like all, uh, so this pi of the two rotations specific. Yes, so that is for pi of the two rotation, mm -hmm. and then we uh, then we make all the single cubic gates from that. Mm -hmm. And virtual. Yeah, the virtual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so again, I will skip this because uh, it's uh, too much, and uh, also in interest of time. Uh, yes, as I said, I wasn't going to talk a lot about Verida. Uh, we do a very simple experiment, calibrated, which we just uh, try to measure the qubit, and we map the response that we get from the system onto the IQ plane, phase, and amplitude, and we try to find the discrimination line. On the left side, we have the ground state. On the right side, we have the excited state, so it's standard thing that everyone does. And this also tells us what the fidelity of the readout is by simply looking at the probability of measuring the correct state if you apply this method, right? Um, so this is what we report typically. Uh, and the simple optimization that we can do is we just sweep the frequency of the readout. We have some more advanced steps, and, but uh, I'm not talking about them today. So this is a simple thing that you can do. So it's just an experimental so if we pick the initial frequency by just measuring the resonator, and then we will we pick the best value of uh, that gives you the best fidelity. Um, okay. Can I ask? So, uh, like, do you also do calibrate when you 
have many readouts simultaneously. Yeah, so so we typically calibrate this simultaneously. Uh, for many for many qubits, qubits. At the same time, yes. So because we have all the qubits, like generally the the default way of operating is to read out all the qubits, regardless mm -hmm. of what you're doing. So in, even if the user asks to measure three qubits out of twenty, the pulse is actually sent to all twenty qubits because that's how it was calibrated. And then you just receive the results from the feed that you wanted to have. Mm -hmm. But like this readout calibration, I, I guess you will observe some cross stuff. Because of... like you show just this mesh between like two states. And... Yes. So we typically just do that. Mm -hmm. uh, or uh, you, you can you can do those measurements mm -hmm. yourself and, uh, and calibrate like the full assignment matrix mm -hmm. that tells you which states um, for example, what is the probability of measuring correctly? This is one zero, and if you try to measure one zero, then what you get in others and so on. Uh, but the basic way that we run this is we just look at um, single qubits. We don't have that much crosstalk in terms of readout, so that is um, that strategy is okay. essentially works most of the time. Yeah. Okay. Um, so let's go to to keep against and first the coupler of optimization. So I said that you use the we use the coupler to minimize the set of interaction between the between the qubits. So in order to measure that, we just um, um, measure the qubit frequency when the other qubit is in an excited state versus ground state, and we take the difference. So we get this conditional frequency, and we just pick the point when conditional frequency is zero. The way that the system is designed, you essentially have like those two crossings in this picture because it's not logarithmic scale. You cannot see it very well, but here in the logarithmic scale, you see that it goes uh, sort of beyond zero and then it goes up. I mean, it's a fake logarithmic scale. Um, so we're looking on the crossing to zero here. Um, and this presents a certain problem because we try to calibrate all our, the whole chip in parallel because it just takes way less time to do it like this, like this. So we want to do this experiment in parallel. But if we try to calibrate two couplers that are next to each other at the same time, then we cannot do it because we are, want to sweep the frequency of this coupler and this coupler looking at what this qubit is doing and it just cannot do it because we will have a total mess in the in the data. So we can go try to go a step further. So we can do this coupler and this coupler at the same time. But this actually also produces a problem because then we put, for example, this qubit in the excited state then the frequency of this one changes as well as this one. So if this coupler isn't calibrated yet, in the middle one you're calibrating both of those, then it will this will this will give you bias in this measurement. So you basically the zero will shift and you will pick the wrong point because this thing is quite uh, here the, the slope is quite low. Uh, so what we need to do is essentially just give up a little bit and say that any sequence of three couplers in the chip have to be done in separate groups. So that generates eight groups of couplers. So we have to do eight experiments only to calibrate all the couplers of the chip to be uh, to, uh, to 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 zero the set of interaction. So this is a good moment to uh, to talk about parallel operation. Um, for cube for single qubit gates, we add either do uh, operations on all the qubits at the same time. So the Rabi Ramsey experiments, we just do all the qubits at the same time, measure frequency of all the qubits. Or we take every other qubit if the couplers are not yet calibrated. For the two qubit gates, and this is about all the experiments that are involved in the calibration of two qubit gates, we either take the maximum fact, fact approach when each qubit is connected to four couplers. So we just to take every fourth coupler uh, because we need both qubits for calibration. So this is like distance one, this is what this refers to. Or we can do this strong edge coloring distance to where the only condition is that out of every three connected couplers, uh, every uh, they have three different colors, so they belong to three different groups. And that results in like eight parallel groups of experiments we do. And uh, if we do the whole calibration in this way on any any size chip, that the performance of this is as good as individual games. Because any uh, any sort of missing performance in this case comes from the interaction that is not fully zeroed or something like this in the coupler and not the crosstalk actually. So this is a fully like the interactions were described by like two like free body Hamiltonian and not 
the crosstalk effects, which are not included in that. Uh, okay. So let's uh, talk about the CCK. Uh, as I mentioned, what we start from is we put the one, one, and two zero states uh, near resonance. And then uh, we uh, shift the coupler up in frequency. And that causes the interaction to turn on. Uh, and then they oscillate. So those two split and they start oscillating. Uh, and what we try to do is we stop at full oscillation. So when the one one goes back to being one one, uh, and there's nothing left in two zero. And if you do it correctly, then it also generates a phase on this one one state. And we also calibrate it to be exactly pi. So then we get this gate. You can generate the CZD, CZ gate, the diagonal gate. Uh, when we do it, the qubits also acquire a phase. So the qubit frequency changes during when we change the coupler frequency and go down. And uh, that has to be compensated with virtual zero rotation. So actually, the actual gate that we do with the pools has also some phases on the diagonal, but they are local phases, so we can fix them later. So when, uh, when we calibrate the CZ gate, we have like three main parameters. We have the width, or how long it takes. We have the amplitude, or to which frequency the coupler gets. And then we have the shape, which is obviously a sort of a big category, like those two things are scalar and this is the vector. Uh, but we determine the shape by mix of theory, simulation, experiments. So this is another deep topic of what the shape is. Uh, we typically use a Slepian shape, which is designed to minimize leakage to the coupler, which is a problem in those cases. But the width and amplitude we determine experimentally by fixing those two parameters. So first experiment, we put the qubits in one one state with single qubit gates, and then we play the pulse and we just let it evolve. And in the end, we like take them back to the ground state. So that generates a picture like this, when we the 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 the, the dark blue uh, is measurement of one one, and this is measuring of something else, which typically means that one of the qubits is in the second excited state, the other is in the ground state or some superposition. So we then say that our gate is somewhere of this line. Uh, when we put one qubit in the superposition state, and then the other we either put in one state or we, or we keep it in the ground state, and then we can apply a pulse of a different phase on this qubit after the pulse is done, and we change this, this phase to what it is, and that lets us estimate the phase that was applied here. And then we just take the difference between the phase applied when this qubit was in the ground state and the phase applied when it was in the excited state. So then you get this conditional phase and uh, we just pick the point where it's pi. And the last thing to do would be to calibrate those virtual Z gates, um, uh, which we uh, just measure by applying a different number of flux pulses and then uh, unwrapping that phase and picking again the point where uh, where we, we get a flat line. So we just apply some Z gates after every 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 CZ, every flux pulse, and uh, we measure what number is correct, essentially. So after we do all of those three steps, we essentially already have the CZ gate. It might not be very good, but uh, it is all you need to do. And this is also how we recalibrate it. Uh, yeah. Okay, so this is another advanced topic which I might not want to go into. Um, but essentially, we can also do um, to get rid of this problem that gets essentially comes from uh, the interaction not being completely zero in like between different states. We can also just pause the qubit as well instead of keeping it on resonance from the beginning. Uh, this is a different way. Uh, we can do error amplification, the conditional phase, population exchange. Uh, yeah. So in terms of configuring the tuning the whole chip, we have those two uh, options. First is just to uh, the, uh, give the qubits constant in two qubit gate. The other one is when we pulse them. And that uh, informs the strategy for the entire chip. Uh, we essentially separate qubits into two groups. One has a lower frequency, the other has a higher frequency. 
and then you apply a little bit of this order to minimize the cost. Um, so you can comment on like what do you mean? Like you apply this order to minimize the so cost. So what do you, what I mean is basically that they don't have to be exactly on this resonance here. They don't have to be exactly on the resonance. So we keep them like slightly off resonance and we make sure that different qubits that are close don't have frequency. Ah, exactly similar. the same. Okay. They are similar within like 10 megahertz. Okay. Um then we so have but why are you breaking them into two groups? Uh, because we want we want uh, we want this condition to be true for for each pair that is next to each other, right? So so you uh, this condition meaning that they that the two zero and one one are or near mm -hmm. resonance, right? Okay. So that means that because the one two transition has lower frequency than the zero one transition, we want the one two transition of one qubit to be similar to the zero one transition of the other, which means that the zero one transition of that one has to be higher mm, because the harmonicities are pretty similar for uh, everything. So hence two groups, let's say. Yeah. And, okay, yes. it's like one. Yes, so basically the qubits that are connected by a coupler are in two different groups. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay, good. And the way we benchmark individual gates is with uh, Clifford randomized benchmarking. We used to have different methods like state tomography. We have something called OSY, and we still have them, but we don't use them because our gates got so good that uh, those other measurements are either perfect or dominated by spam errors. So they don't tell us anything. So we just use Clifford randomized benchmarking, which is a technique where you get um, random gates from the Clifford group, which is a subgroup of all the possible. Um, Either one qubit operations or two qubit operations, which is uh, classically uh, simulatable very fast. So we can calculate this inverse gate easily. So we just get some random m random Clifford gates. We calculate the inverse, and then we always want to get the same state. And then we just use a lot of different uh, sets of random gates, and they essentially, by being random, convert our error into like a depolarization channel. And then from that depolarization probability, we get like an exponential decay. And how fast is decaying instead of telling us our qubit, our uh, gate fidelity. And then the second uh, uh, version of it is the interleaved randomized benchmarking. So if the gate we're trying to benchmark is also a Clifford, then we can put it inside, like in the middle of each two gates, and then um, do the same thing. And the additional depolarization probability that results from this, because that will decay faster, the additional depolarization probability is proportional to like the error of the gate. So a typical data set for a single qubit gate, we do not interleave because we want to calculate gate fidelity for like all the different gates because we scale our, we, we create our X and Y and square root of X and square root of Y from the same sort of calibration. We want to have all of them together and then get like the average fidelity for average gate that we do. So we typically run it non-interleaved. And then for two qubit gates, we have a very specific gate we try to benchmark. And also those Clifford elements, they contain single qubit gates as well. So the number that we typically pay attention to is the um, is the interleaved uh, fidelity that we get. So here we can also do two gates or three gates, which is telling us like how much worse is the second gate or the third gate compared to the first one, which can also happen for the reasons that I'm not going to talk about. And then we can ex extend that method to also measure the leakage by simply reading out the, third, the second excited state. So these are the results for this uh, funky gate that I mentioned before. So, well. um, yeah, I'll, I'll just leave it. Sorry, funky gates. Yeah, so that that uh, that advanced shape that we that we got with. Uh, I mean to realize that that. Uh... So, so, or I mean, that was for single qubit. That was for single qubit. Okay, yeah. Okay. So that is for the shape that the, that I talked about briefly with the two dips, right? So the the point of that was to minimize leakage, and it was achieved. So this is the another method of benchmarking, essentially the specific part of the um of our yeah specific case we have. Okay. Uh. Right. I do have some more um, 
slides about the cross. I think I won't be talking about the overall QPU uh, benchmarks because there's no time. Uh, so I'll just maybe briefly do this and then some fidelities. So we can measure the crosstalk in the drive and in the flux. So in the drive, what it tells us is when we try to drive a qubit from not its own drive line, but some drive line that belongs to some other qubit in the chip, we shouldn't be able to do that, but we are. Um, so we are measuring how hard we have to drive it with how big amplitude to get the pi rotation compared to driving it from its own drive line. And that gives us a measure of crosstalk. So you can see that the, um, the, the, the crosstalk is weakly correlated to distance. So we have typically higher uh, crosstalk when the qubits are close, which shouldn't be uh, surprising, but our results are still about in 10 dB better than those recent works. And uh, so, um, sorry, can I ask? Uh, like, so those are in some units, like, yes, uh, like... these are in the uh, decibels. Right. So let me explain a bit. So those like, omegas are amplitude. Yeah, the omegas are the amplitude. Okay. So the omega is the amplitude of the poles that you need to drive. Which way around is it? So the omega i is the amplitude of the poles that you need to drive to, to get a pi rotation, but driving the qubit with its own drive line. And then the j is the amplitude on the poles that you need to drive the qubit from some other mm -hmm. drive. Mm -hmm. And typically, the i will be very, very small because you use a very, very long pulse for this to make, make it even possible to do that. So then this is, this is the measure of crosstalk that we can get directly. Um, so our fidelities uh, measures with randomized benchmarking. Um, we uh, get around uh, one or one thousand uh, for most of the, our devices, um, and this is like the median. Uh, the, yeah, this is a, a box plot, a typical box plot that shows you the all of the gates in the chip, so each of this corresponds to the entire chip that we measure. We can either measure them in distance two or distance one, which means distance one means all, all the qubits on the chip at the same time, and then distance two is basically the qubits that are on one end of the coupler, right? So the ones that are not connected to each other, so in two groups, um, and then individual. So uh, we do get that doing this other strategy where we pull the qubit, we get better to better single qubit gates. And this is the result uh, with this test device with this new method of minimizing the leakage, which is an order of magnitude better. We also measure flux crosstalk. Uh, so the idea here is uh, I'll explain this in more detail. Um, we try to change qubit frequency by uh, applying a, a, a pulse or a voltage to its own flux line. And then we do the same thing by trying to apply the pulse to another flux line. And obviously the pulse that we apply to some other flux line has to be much stronger. So then we get this ratio and we take a logarithm and that is our measure of crosstalk. So uh, here we see that the technology to use for flip chip reduces the crosstalk significantly. This crosstalk is relevant for two qubit gates mostly because the two qubit gates are realized with the flux pulse. And we also observe no independent, no, no dependence in distance, which is the reason why we say that the uh, worst two qubit gates when in the other configuration are mostly due to some interaction. But there is a little bit of crosstalk in there as well. So the fidelities of two qubit gates um, are an order of magnitude worse than single qubit gates. Um, and we also see that for the for the, for the gate with, the, with dynamic qubit tuning, which are those two, measuring with distance two gives you much better results than measuring with distance one, because this effect of uh, applying qubit fluxes, uh, qubit flux pulses um, to qubit frequency makes makes the uh, this, this this delicate balance between the coupler turning the the, uh, the interaction to zero break a little bit, and that reduces the fidelity of the gates. And again, in our test device, we can reach about 99.8, uh, a little bit maybe less than that. So again, an order of magnitude better. So all of those things are coming to keep use as well. 
Okay, so I will not be talking about all of that because we don't have time. Uh, unless you really want to hear about it and we don't have other uh, questions. So maybe, uh, so you did you want to talk about it to begin with or not? Like uh, I did, but I was also not, I didn't expect the questions during the talk, but it's okay. Okay, uh, so uh, maybe we can, let's go on. Let's continue with what you wanted to do. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so after we uh, benchmark individual gates in the chip, we can then think about how to benchmark the entire chip as one sort of uh, quantum computer system. So the first method that we use is called the mirror randomized benchmarking. So what this is, is a very easy to test, it. it's easy to calculate what it should give. Um, so in every layer, each qubit is receiving a gate. It could be either a single qubit gate or a two qubit gate. So it's like a maximally dense circuit. And then uh, we take the entire layer and we apply some random gates and then we invert that. And that gives it uh, a calculation of the expected result is very easy because you always get like some sort of Z eigenstate or something like this. Um, and then what we expect is that we have something called polarization, which is like similar to fidelity, but slightly more forgiving. Um, and uh, what we expect is that we have constant error per qubit if we don't have crosstalk. So we have a little bit of crosstalk, so the error per qubit per layer is uh, not uh, exactly flat, but it gets uh, flatter as we progress to the uh, to, to higher number of qubits. So it behaves sort of stably. We can measure for all the qubits uh, with uh, no issues. Um, right. Uh, then we can also prepare some entangled states. So we prepare the GEG state, which we, uh, which is this entangled state of all zeros and all ones. And we measure the fidelity using this method of multiple quantum coherences, it's based in the paper from four years ago, uh, which means that we pre prepare the GEG state, we apply a layer of fade gates, and we unprepare it. And then we read out mitigate. Uh, with the standard Kiskit method of readout error mitigation, which then includes measuring all these matrices of what's assignment for all the different uh, gates, uh, uh, states that you can get. And then we measure this uh, multi partite entanglement witness, which is just based on the fidelity of the GZ state. And you can entangle all the 20 qubits on the chip uh, with readout error mitigation. This is data from the cloud um, chip. The German chip that just got delivered yesterday, uh, delivered a long time ago, but accepted yesterday, has 19 qubits without uh, without error, without error mitigation. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, we also have some more uh, application benchmarks that this is required by uh, the Eviden, which is the super uh, super computing center giant. So they've come up with this uh, problem that is that for, for them is a sort of an application-based problem that we can solve. Uh, so you're solving the Maxcal problem, which is a graph uh, mathematical problem, which is, I think, entry complete. You try to find the maximum number of edges in the graph in such a way that the opposite, that the vertices that connect to it have different colors. So we color them in some ways and colors, and then you want to find the maximum number of edges that connect to different colors. And you can um, solve that with quantum approximate optimization algorithm, which is an algorithm that includes finding an expectation value in some Hamiltonian and then um, using like a machine learning technique on a classical computer. And then typically what we do is we take the graph and we select some node, uh, which is the most connected and we kind of color it one color and then the other nodes are represented by qubits. So these are the results from the five qubit chip, which uh, find this state as being the max cut, and that is incorrect. But also we have a lot of noise here. So yeah, the um, evident people define success as this fraction beta, which is the similarity between exact solution and the approximate solution. If you have 0 0.2, which is something that the random algorithm gave you, then you succeeded. And for this cloud device that we have available, we can do up to 15 nodes or 14 qubits. 
So we can essentially solve useful algorithms on the Mendai chip. Uh, okay, I don't want to talk about this. Um, and then we also the quantum volume, which is a less forgiving benchmark, which is the IBM benchmark. And what that is, is we uh, apply the sigma, which is the just permutation of all the qubits. And then between two neighboring qubits, which might not be neighboring in the chip, we apply a random two qubit gate. Um, from now, it's not a Clifford, it's just S4. Uh, and yeah, and then if we can do n layers with n qubits, then we uh, successfully, which means that you have this heavy output probability above uh, two thirds, um, then we can claim that we have a new volume of n up to the end. So we'll be past uh, two to the five. So not that much, uh, maybe, but um, this is a not very forgiving benchmark. And finally, we can measure how fast our quantum computers are by um, uh, looking at the uh, quantum approximate um, uh, optimization algorithm with ansatz. So the idea is that you uh, have some qubits, have some circuits with some parameters, then you send it, you get the results, update the parameters, send it again, and you just measure the time all of it takes, right? So you are not allowed to cheat, and you can use the quantum volume circuit that you pass. So we can use up to five layers because we pass for five layers. And then we get number of layers times number of uh, different circuits that we have, number of parameter updates, um, uh, over the total time it takes, and we get 2,600, which is pretty good. So yeah, so this is the results for our chip on the cloud, the summary, which is uh, pretty good, uh, all things considered. Um, yeah. So I don't have much more to say other than we have uh, good devices. We calibrate our qubit. A single qubit gate to be, pretty, to be very, very good, and we characterize this in multiple ways. Uh, so yeah, I would like to acknowledge all my colleagues and uh, within IQM that collaborate that helped bring our devices to this level. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, we have time for questions or comments. The speaker. So I, I would ask. Are you better than the IBM quantum? Uh, I mean, there are certain things which we play in the same league, but obviously, if you look at the number of qubits that they have, that we don't have that many. So, uh, in obvious way, I would say that our point. Like, I, I I don't think we've what what I'm supposed to officially say, but in my personal view, our quality is pretty good and it's on par with theirs. Yeah. So if you just need twenty qubits and not hundred fifty, then our devices, I think, are. Similar quality. So, like on the previous slide, you showed the largest GED state is one in both right? Yeah. So, was that the heavy for that state larger than one half? Or because I remember the so before you also showed this the speed of the speed of the was. Yeah. Mm. Right. So, it is. It is larger than one and a half if you apply the readout error mitigation, mm -hmm. uh, and it's about sixty-two percent. If you, without readout error mitigation, it's uh, you you get up to fourteen on this device. Okay, and have you tried uh, some other graph state? Uh, I I have tried myself uh, W state like last weekend, but only on five qubits. Um, so I can get eighty-five uh, percent. From the five qubits. This is a full uh, density matrix reconstruction. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But in the end, why do you try to try to just say, I mean, if you are going to sell this computer, why can you to present it? Mm -hmm. so why, so why you pick the GED state? Uh, so the, the point of, of this benchmark was to show, like, find how many qubits we can have the genuine. Multiplied entanglement on, mm -hmm. and I think the GEC state was picked because the circuit is quite shallow, so we don't need that many gates. The way it scales is that you do one two qubit, well, basically n minus one two qubit gates for an NGE state, mm -hmm. because you just go like one by one. 
And for example, the W state, you need more because I tried to do it and you need more multiple gates. So that's why the fidelity is lower. Essentially, when we did these things and we like fully characterized what is happening, obviously not for 20 qubits, for from a smaller number of qubits, we see that um, it is fully consistent with the like just longitudinal uh, relaxation. So the qubits just decay with the T1 effect once, like as long as the, 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 just the algorithm gets pretty long. And the GG state is quite fast because it doesn't have that many gates, so we can stay in that lane. But at the same time, it draws um, draws back, it goes down with the number of kids, right? So, yeah. So maybe it's better to I mean, consider some other states which are easier to produce than the GZ states, and they are still generally harder. Yeah, we mean we could do that. But this is you know I I don't do that personally, so I I can we have also already like I. I remember that suggestion from you where you visited that. So I, already then I forwarded it to, to people, but like that wasn't, that wasn't, uh, like right. either, either uh, it was maybe there or I don't really know. Yeah. Is the chip working at room temperature? No. Uh, so we have the, uh, so this is uh, our setup. So this, Fridge is where the chip is sitting, and that pulls the pulls the whole chip to about twenty milliconvolts. So it's a, it's a cryogenic temperature. Yeah. I I didn't want to show all of this because it was like too much. But uh, I have it. If you are have asked, have questions about the hardware, I can also ask. So yeah, this this is very low temperature near near absolute zero. I have a question from a different perspective. So let's assume that I have some something which. I can, I want to do, I don't like it. some computation or whatever. Mm -hmm. I have two ways of doing the same thing. So I want to compare which one would be better to implement on your device. Mm -hmm. What property should I look for or optimize over to kind of say, okay, on your computer, I will get the best result. So would that be like less gate, which I like two qubit or whatever? Do you have mm -hmm. something like it? Uh, so if you have two circuits and you just want to find out which ones, which circuit is better, typically you can assume some noise model which we provide with just individual fidelities of the gates and also the T1 and the T2 times. So I wasn't talking about that, but it's pretty standard. So we have the coherence times and the relaxation times, but those are included. Like if you have cloud access or some sort of access, have some calibration, those are included in the backend. So you can ask the backend to calculate for you which circuit is better, assuming the noise model where when you don't do any gate, there's a relaxation, but when you do a gate, then it's just the fidelity of the gate and those are known. Mm -hmm. So that way you can calculate the expected fidelity of the circuit properly. Um, uh, what's it? There is a question online, I guess. Oh, there is. Okay. Hi, hi, Kuba, this is Yarek. Uh, so I have a question uh, regarding the GAG state and the W state. Uh, I don't know. Can you hear me, guys? I'm I'm not sure if my hardware works okay. Yeah. Uh, so yes, uh, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kuba, so can you uh, show the results that you had for W state? Because somehow I did not get which uh, uh, which was uh, uh, cleaner. So which. Uh, uh, which fidelity was better to GHZ or to uh, pick a state and which one? Mm -hmm. So, uh, okay, so first GHZ. Uh, okay, so these are two different chips. Uh, okay. So, for this is something that I did ah, okay. in my spare time, and uh, the fidelity here was 85. And on the same chip with the same calibration, I got 92 for the five qubits with the GHZ state. Uh, you got 92 for, for ah, okay, so the DK state was uh, a, a bit more noisy, right? Yes, yes, that's true. And if you look at this density matrix, then you see that, I mean, this is quite a small picture, but the main contributor here was the, you have the diagonal, you have the zero zeros, all the zeros here in the corner, and uh, you don't have any off diagonal that includes the all, the all zeros, which suggests that this is just relaxation. It's all zero state that, that lowers the fidelity. Ah, okay, 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 okay. So, 
uh, if this fidelity is so high, so why the uh, fidelity for the GAZ that she was showing was so, I mean, sorry to say it, but low, but it was somewhere like in the vicinity of uh, oh, one half. Okay, so, so sorry because the number of qubits, the, the number of qubits, I guess, for that GAZ was much bigger than for this W, right? Yeah, yeah. So but this graph starts at ten qubits. So ah, 10 got it. Here. Got it. And and the other one was uh, five or six qubits, right? Yeah, just five. Yes. Just five qubits. Okay. 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 Got it. Yeah. Got it. Got it. So and if you if did you, if did you, you nine, then you get as well ninety percent for five qubits. Uh, so okay, it's, it's consistent. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This this is I this is something that I missed that it starts at at ten. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, can you, uh, okay, I wanted to ask something more. So, like, what's the layout in, in the end of the devices? Because that also might affect. Uh, let me go to the beginning. Rectangular lattice. It's a, re it's a, it's a rectangular la la lattice. So, I can show you the exact layout. Do, 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 do. Uh, okay, in the beginning. Uh, yes, so yeah, these are the layouts. So we have a rectangular lattice, both of the rectangular lattice. So essentially, this is one qubit in the center, and they have four qubits that are connected to it. And here you have this sort of lattice. This lattice was selected to implement a single logical qubit of distance by surface cone. That's why it looks so weird. Uh, but uh, we don't have any announcement about working on it. It's not working. But this is the justification for why it's not like straight. No. Uh, right. Okay. I see. Eric has another question. Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, well, um, stop me if you, if I'm like asking too much. Uh, Kuba, I wanted to ask uh, from your perspective, uh, how do you envision the scalability? Because I mean, from the point of view of the readout. Then at some moment, I guess it's going to be very dense, the spectrum is going to be very like highly populated with the individual frequencies for each individual qubit. So like from your perspective, what you can share, of course, with us, uh, where do you think would be the technological limit of, uh, of this transmon technology? Is it like, I don't know, 1000 chips or 5000 or 10,000? Uh, so just to so first I clarify about the readout. So this uh, this five qubit chip has only one readout line. So as you say, the frequency crowding. So you have to have different frequency for each readout resonator not to work. But the twenty qubit chip already have three readout lines. So we have three different instruments doing the readout. So we have like seven, eight, and no seven, six, and six or something like this per readout resonator. And then for the chips that are coming. Uh, with the even more qubits, I think this one has eight lines or something like this. So the frequency crowding does not affect us because we can just have more readout lines, uh, and then the frequencies uh, we can we can repeat them because they are not coupled; they are not on the same line, so they don't interact. Um, but in terms of scalability of the transform technology, uh, well, I I think personally you can get up to thousand, and then we have to think about some other solutions mm -hmm. that and uh, what would I've be... seen today. Pardon? Uh, sorry, yeah, sorry, okay. I interrupted you. Yeah, 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 sorry, sorry. Please continue. I, I interrupted you. There is a little bit of a delay online. Oh, no, I just wanted to say that uh, there are some solutions that um, exist for, for example, uh, putting the, reducing the number of lines that go inside the inside the cryostat from outside by just uh, creating the a quantum control module inside the on the chip uh, or or some other 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 idea that are that can be used for that um so yeah and then we obviously can do links between different fridges uh, and use some other technology for that so there are some some of the ideas that are that are floating but uh uh, and in general, sort of um, discourse, not precisely like QM maybe, 
because I can, cannot really say what like higher technologies we want to develop. Uh, but there are ideas that are public by sort of other institutes and companies that include strategies like that to scale it above 1,000. Uh, so I, if I understand correctly, then the problem is uh, not the free eventual frequency grounding on the readout, but really the physical uh, physical lines that go inside the cryostat, which basically create a, a, a heat bridges. Yeah, so it's like if you have yes, so, yes. too many qubits, then you have to put so many uh, lies and as we learn, this uh, specialized wire is very expensive, but even that expensive wire will create a, a heat bridge that will heat up the cryostat, right? Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So in, in our architecture, because uh, because we have uh, around two couplers per qubit, and each qubit has three lines, and then each coupler has one line, then that gets us to about five lines per qubit, mm. and like the uh, the limit. So then they have to go somewhere, right? Um, and each has an means and instruments that generate some signals on it, and so on. Okay, got it. Got it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank the speaker again. Okay, thank you.